All right, welcome everybody. We have a, a great panel for you focused on esports production. Uh, my name is Jason Dackman. I'm chief editor at SVG Americas and I run our uh, uh, esports events uh, out in the US. And uh, I got a trio of phenomenal panelists here to talk a little bit about esports production. Now, for those of you who are just mildly or not familiar uh, with esports, these guys have been embracing sort of those next gen technologies for a long time, be it cloud, uh, public internet uh, usage, um, uh, virtual studios, things like that. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And just like everybody else, this stuff got accelerated. But in the case of esports, a lot of the publishers and event organizers, again, since they were so aware and comfortable with these technologies, kind of were able to get out ahead of it and return faster than some of the major leagues and federations were able to, uh, and, and really ramp up events pretty quickly and, and ramp up their production workflows remotely um, rather quickly. So that's what we're going to talk about here today, just give you an overview of how they've handled the last year or so, and uh, and what we can expect coming down the line as we hopefully are inching towards uh, in-person events again. So I want to start with each uh, each of you, and Andy Lane from Face It. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you. Uh, if you can just give some quick background on you know what you guys do, what uh, your role is in the esports ecosystem, and then uh, an overview of basically how you've conducted business over the last year uh, during the pandemic, and how your preparation prior to that maybe prepared you guys a little bit for the last year. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I work with Face It. We're a tournament organizer and online platform. Um, so we've kind of got two sides to our business. One is uh, is basically an online platform that makes uh, does matchmaking for, for a number of titles. That side of the business um, is pretty much completely online. And it's honestly it's done phenomenally well in the pandemic, as you might expect, with a, a surge of new gamers joining joining our ranks. So that side of things very excited. But specifically, I work for the um, broadcast and media operations side of the business. Um, and we work in uh, basically the production of esports tournaments, which is pretty much what everyone on this panel does. Um, so our, our focus um, throughout the pandemic has been adapting for our clients and for some of our homegrown properties. Um, ultimately, we, we got hit right in the middle of one of our productions when, when the COVID restrictions came into play in the US, which was phenomenally disruptive. But to give you an idea of how quickly we were able to turn that around, we were still able to have a product running in, I think it was four days we were off air for, um, that was unscheduled. And after that, we were we were back on air. Um, and we're really fortunate with esports is that this is somewhere where it's all, all come from. This is all where, where it all started off, people in their bedrooms, players at home, playing online. So as a sport, it can continue. You don't have to have the players go down to the field. It's obviously better if they're there, but um, it, it, they can still play on the online battlefield. Um, and it works just as well for us. It just means we have to adjust things on the broadcast side of things. Um, on, on sort of like a four tier scheme. We've done some stuff on site. We haven't had any players around, but we have done stuff on site with full precautions and testing and ongoing um, various social distancing schemes, depends on which country we're operating in. Um, we've done studio stuff out of our existing facilities where we, we already have precautions in place, screens and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we've been able to have a small footprint of talent on site. Um, we've also um, invested quite heavily in virtual studios and hybrid workflows. So we're able to have talent come in from all over the world and players come in from all over the world and bring them into a virtual environment, which is a bit more exciting than just having them on screen with a with a sort of moving background or something like that. And then we've done stuff that is completely fully remote and um, in the cloud um, that doesn't really require any of those bits and pieces, but still comes together as a, as a complete show uh, and looks great. So ultimately it's been a mixed bag for us, but we, we've coped with it relatively well and used a lot of the, the things we've yet learned growing up in esports to to sort of like move forward. Great, thanks Andy. So you guys have sort of pick and choose from each of those uh, various uh, areas when it comes to- <laughs> it's, been, it's been challenging, put it that way, especially when you've got different rules in different countries. And I'm sure the other guys attest to it, like you, you really, it kind of depends on where you're operating as to what you can do and what you can't. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Nicholas Estrup, wanna go to you. Blast, one of the, the you know, more innovative uh, event organizers and event runners when it comes to the esports world. Um, again, same thing. What's the last year been like for you? And give us a little idea of how you've maybe embraced this whole remote, virtualized cloud world that, that you uh, have had to operate in because of the pandemic. 
Of course. <clears throat> so at, at Blast, much like the gentleman on the call as well, right? We're used to filling big arenas everywhere in the world. And we've gone from doing that to filling Zoom calls and whatever could be filled with uh, digital fans and the like. And I think looking back at, at what we've done to transition and how we kind of approached it in the beginning was very much from the mindset of um, we obviously couldn't do the big arena show, but what we could do was not necessarily go all in on figuring out how to blow the socks off people while they're sitting at home but probably more try to take it from the approach of back to basics, like was mentioned just now, right? It's the place that's not our desired starting point when doing an event, but it's a place we feel extremely comfortable in, uh, in operating online events. And I think with, with that in mind, I think our approach very much was to reach a point where if we can just for a second get the viewers at home on their couches or in front of their PCs to just forget, just for one brief second, that they're watching an online digital event, then we saw that as a massive success, right? And I think we we definitely took that as, as the main mantra in everything that we did. So back to basics, but also elevating from there into creating normalcy in a not very normal time. I think that was to us crucial, you know, all the glitz and glamor of big fancy studios that can do a ton of stuff in XR and whatever have you is fine. But I think if we get them to forget that COVID is happening, that this isn't just a normal event. I think that's a bigger success for us. So that was kind of our approach into it. Right. Just a respite from everything that was going on. Just enjoy a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Simon Eicher from ESL Gaming. Simon, ESL, you know, one of uh, the biggest heavyweights, one of the pioneers when it comes to uh, esports. Uh, you guys were there right in the beginning and, and now still one of the largest uh, organizers and, and names in esports. So you, uh, again, another person who's very used to filling arenas, filling large venues and so on. How did you adapt and how did some of these workflows get created so that you could continue doing business and keep the lights on with events uh, happening? Yeah, I think first of all, I think we were the first to be hit, right? Last year, I am Katowice, uh, the evening before opening the doors, we unfortunately, uh, together with uh, the local government, had to decide that uh, no audience uh, is allowed to enter. So we had the last arena event, but unfortunately, without any fans on site. And since then, uh, what was mentioned before, uh, we tried to be agile, uh, improve. Uh, our focus was always, let's bring up a show as um, uh, it's important to to keep the people entertained, right? I think the mention was right. Uh, let's try uh, to, to have entertainment there to replace all the concerns, fears people had um, around COVID and, and give them something back uh, that they can enjoy and have pleasure around. And uh, therefore, um, we also didn't really care in that sense. Uh, obviously, keeping a certain quality bar is important, but it was uh, really, let's let's bring the games on. Let's make sure in-game has a good experience as close as possible uh, to what the, the viewers are used to, but the rest uh, is uh, not that relevant in that sense. And that's how we basically started. Then uh, in, in continuing March last year, moving into April, uh, when we had uh, ESL Pro League running, it produced then also the first virtual sets uh, moving forward and just try to be there uh, to run the tournaments. Uh, do a decent broadcast and entertain the fans. Sure. And you guys really did have one of the last. I mean, IEM Katowice is, is one of the largest, most well-known events, and you were able to get it done, but not with uh, with a full crowd. So that we, I think a lot of people look at that as sort of that was that, you know, last one, you got in right under the wire, and then, and then you had to adapt after that. Um, great, guys. Well, uh, for everybody watching, you kind of get an idea of what the last year has been like, what um, these organizations represent individually in terms of uh, really embracing virtual cloud uh, remote workflows. So let's talk about what worked and what didn't over the last year. Um, I, I think the second, the latter probably being even more important, what, what didn't work. So Andy, I'll go back to you. Um, you mentioned some of the things that you guys ramped up and you said you chose from various different pockets of the production uh, philosophy world. What was there one or two tools or one or two workflows that really, really came in handy for you? And just as importantly, was there something that you tried that, that, that didn't really pan out and you had to change gears? I mean, there's always something that, that doesn't pan out and we have to change gears. Like, that's just what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so one of the big things that came into it for us was was cloud early on. Um, it's something that we've been using for years, just doing things in the background, tinkering along and, and doing all sorts of IT more orientated tasks. We thought about, but not really put into action too much of um, actually fully virtualizing an entire production, if you like. Um, but it's something we moved to pretty quickly. Um, what we found with it is it's it's one of these things that it works, it doesn't work. <laughs> Especially right. when you start off with it, because you, you can't think exactly the same. You have to think a little bit differently about how you engineer those kind of workflows. It, it's not quite the same world you used to where you plug in a cable and it just works. You've got all of these things flying around in a in an open cloud where ultimately, even if you've got your own little private network, sometimes somebody else comes on and, you know, it, 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 it can get a bit messy sometimes. So you do have to think about how you engineer those sort of processes so that it doesn't happen to you. Um, so we had a bit of weird results with it initially and then pushed it out a little bit further and then sort of smoothed it out, got all the, all the little um, glitches sorted. Uh, and then it, it really kind of worked, started to work for us quite well on, our, on, on a lot of our productions. Um, and we, we kind of had to think outside the box and think that you can't always expect identical results and you can't always expect identical challenges that you'll face in studio. Um, so that was one of the key things that we found was was in, important to, to sort of like keeping us going, but certainly initially, because it's everyone's got to go home. We can still work. We can still virtualize all this stuff. We can still keep broadcasts working. Um, then we sort of moved into the studio kind of the world of things that presents in, in, initial challenges and different different things you don't expect when you go into a studio environment. All of a sudden, your engineers have to stand two meters apart from each other. Well, they're right. not used to doing that, are they? <laughs> so every single little bit of piece, every piece of the puzzle takes that extra little bit longer to get done. We have to elongate timelines. We have to elongate production um, sort of uh, builds builds and stuff like that. We maybe have to have one crew in one day, one crew in a different day. So it presented different challenges from a production or broadcast standpoint and all these extra things that you just have to jump through the hoops and just have to make it happen. And all very important to making sure the production still goes ahead. But um, they're things that, they work, but you have to think about them in a different way. So it, it was right. really kind of a massive learning experience, even for us. And we've been doing it, those kind of things for a long time. So there were things that definitely brought us up around and there were things that, that certainly made things a bit more challenging. Yeah, I, everybody in our business, everybody in the world, for for lack uh, beyond that, but uh, everybody in the broadcast business had to relearn and then learn again, and it was it was some interesting times. So uh, that that was that was good. Uh, Nicholas, on the blast side, one or two things that really came in handy and just as important. Uh, anything that you tried and just didn't work out. Of course. So I think what, what for us really worked or where we at least felt an immediate effect in increasing something and increasing excitement or joy from the fans was increasing video feeds. I think in, in the beginning, we we tried to work with with a, let's call it a bare bone amount of feeds, much like, you know, in big arena shows, you have 30 to 40 video feeds from cameras on the floor, player cams, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what, what we tried to do was to just ramp that up to back to the point around what what is looked upon as normal. We had individual cams sent to all the players taking part, which meant that all of a sudden we were juggling 500 plus video feeds. And I think what we saw there was, was just a clear uh, spike in enjoyment from the crowd that was watching, right? Because all of a sudden you could see the players sitting at home. If you look at an online esports production, that's the norm now. Back then it, it wasn't really in the early stage of COVID that took a ton of planning and a lot of urgent shipment <laughs> to left and right of the world. So I, think, yeah. <laughs> so I think that that to us was was a place where we felt that that was worth the effort put in in trying to juggle the amount of video feeds and, and getting cameras and kits out to all these different you know players and talent. And I think with that, back to the, the mindset around it, it's not always the big ticket items that does it. I think low practical analog things like just do some good backdrops Make sure everyone is sitting on the same chair in the same height, same distance to the camera, on the same camera. You know, all those things that are somewhat obvious just really helps elevate it. There's some people like the players. I want to see what their weird bed looks like in the corner behind them. But on a talent member, a host who's exciting me and welcoming me to the show, I don't want to see that. Um, so I think that was one part. I think when looking at, at what didn't work as well, I think it's actually something that worked well in the beginning and it's kind of hitting a wall now. And that to us is the whole fan cam aspect, right? I remember we were some of the first to try to get 300 plus crazy Brazilians into fan camps and on Zoom, and that was an enjoyable experience. But I think what we learned 
we ended up actually pulling them from the broadcast in the middle of an event, I think, um, because it just didn't give that same satisfaction anymore, right? People at home were actually getting annoyed by the fan camps where they had sparked joy and madness early on. I think COVID fatigue in the entertainment space kind of hit with that. And I, and I think now when I see it elsewhere as well, and it's clearly became the, become the norm in sports now, right? Just get digital fans in everywhere and then you've kind of solved it. Uh, I actually feel the exact, exact opposite when I see it. Now. I get annoyed, like, oh, here we go. Another another one of those walls full of people. And, right. and that to us was something that that started great, but but now it's probably at a place where people aren't really feeling it anymore. And Simon, what about you? Uh, what are you thinking on this one? <sighs> That's a tough one. I think a lot of stuff uh, worked as more or less intended uh, with the motivation to have a broadcast again and to deliver something to the fans. I think in terms of the, the quality bar itself, uh, fluctuations are definitely acceptable. And uh, I think this is the same also with other sports when you see the broadcast. Currently we do accept an environment that is not uh, pre-COVID in terms of the quality overall, that's for sure. Um, I think in many areas we, we were able to compensate that. Uh, let's say sometimes uh, with uh, rather unconventional workflows uh, in some areas uh, switching actually to classical workflows uh, where we had uh, some MacGyver stuff uh, done in the past and that worked for us. Um, in terms of uh, what really, really worked, I think is really the attention and the, the extra mile that everyone was willing to go. So this is not from a technical, but actually from a people perspective uh, where everyone at ESL can be super proud on, on what we achieved. What didn't work very well is um, actually nothing major i think you try right. an error a lot right um but uh, there was nothing where we really felt hey we were close and something failed so that's overall all okay all right great guys um well i want to then look a little bit into the future so you talked about some of the things that you're able to innovate sometimes on the fly uh to get through the last year now we are in a bit of a hybrid mode, still very much in a pandemic, but not, you know, minimizing that at all. Um, but a little bit moving into a hybrid, you know, more on prem, more and more, hopefully fans coming back at some point in the somewhat near future. What's going to stick from these workflows and these technologies that you have embraced over the last year? What is going to stick and be a permanent part of your production ecosystem moving forward? Um, Andy, why don't you go first? So I think um, some of the things that have been most transformative for us um, have been sort of like the, the ability of having remote workers contribute to a broadcast. It's not something we ever really considered um, too much prior to this. And it's, it's a bit of a yin and a yang, so I'll come back to it probably in a little bit and explain why it's maybe not such a great thing. But sometimes it is worth that extra sort of investment, if you like, or not having that person there but having them able to contribute to the show because one of the biggest things that we're kind of focused on as a as an esports industry is the people who understand what we produce um, and if it means that i have to bring that person over from london and he's working on a show in la or vice versa if it's the right person they'll probably do a better job than somebody who isn't the right person so being able to pull them in using a variety of tools and, and parsec something that's really really good for that it's something that just enables them to be able to use a computer as if it's basically in front of them um so i think that's something that's really going to stick for us so we, we will probably always have maybe a little bit of, of, of remy in our broadcasts um i think in the short term probably playing a little bit safe um is still going to be a thing it, it's sure. you just can't take any risks and we've got to these points before where we think the pandemic's over and then all of a sudden a new wave or a new variant comes out so who really knows if we're we're through it all yet and fingers crossed we are but we, i think definitely playing it safe in the short term um and another thing in, that i found that's quite interesting is is the more these sort of as nicholas mentioned is the use of a lot of video calls and player cams and fan cams i think where that's used sensibly and editorially that makes sense that's something that will probably continue i've seen things uh, where you bring in like a key member perhaps of the player's family or something like that that right. wouldn't normally be there or or somebody who wouldn't normally be there basically just to bring in that extra little bit of a, of a burst of sort of uh, interview and expertise into the broadcast that's something we started doing and if we had like a someone we could just drag in quickly who right. wasn't necessarily there that kind of stuff i think you'll see more and more of us certainly in esports because it really adds that extra depth to the to the storyline of what's going on 
Uh, Nicholas, what's going to stick? Same question to you. What 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 do you like? What are you going to keep around uh, even after things normalize? Hopefully, <laughs> I think some of it has obviously already been mentioned by Andy, and I completely agree with with all this point. And and I think to us, just reevaluating who within the production sits where and why, right? And and that's through and through. Like what can actually be done remote? I think we've seen uh, some horror examples and some good examples. You know, the good ones being the likes of observers, the ones controlling the cameras within the game and kind of directing the game. You know, that's an interesting position that would normally travel with us everywhere, where we can definitely see now that might as well actually just sit at home because it's it's just as efficient and good for both parties, right? So that to us, and I'm sure like, like the other gents here, when flying around 100, 150 people per arena show, anyone off that list that's important savings in the in the big you know grand scheme of things. So I think that is that's one good example, and and that just goes through you know every part of the production. Um, and I think apart from that, I, I think it's just workflows, ways of doing things combined with you know another point mentioned was content. We do these virtual media days, which is much like in traditional sports, right? Players come in, sit down, do a ton of content, leave. And I think normally in a, in a normal TV production, getting people to call in via laptops or phones would send the chill down any production head spine, right? Just from an aesthetics perspective. But that's kind of become normal now. And it's actually not that bad, right? Because you have a player who's in such a factory setting when just being sent through all these content uh, mills and, and doing all the stuff that it it's actually pretty good when when you do it online as well so that's at least something where hopefully the media days will be physical moving forward but these check-ins with players and teams on the move in in the realm like in 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 our world in esports where they go from us as a tournament organizer to one of the others on this call it's a very different space to operate in so i think that is that's an exciting opportunity to to investigate more in, into content that will, will probably be my main bits but but yeah, the, the list of learnings in law is long. And I think if, if it isn't for someone, then they've done something wrong. In this right. Yeah. You, you better come out of this with a bunch of new <laughs> yeah, knowledge. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And and it's interesting too, you know, I'll follow up on something that you said about the uh, the media conferences. Uh, the whole idea of sort of good enough, I, I think it has become a little bit more acceptable. Um, in the old days, you were going to have a really high quality video feed with redundancy behind it or you were going to have nothing right and and now you know i so i'm my I, the question I'll, I'll form it in a question for you guys how do you balance that need for remote operations whether it's crew behind the scenes or talent or uh you know players how do, um how do you balance that with uh you know essentially i want to say sacrificing quality i, I don't want to put it that way but how do you how do you basically get it done and say, hey, we're going to be able to get this done and say, you know what, we don't have a redundant path. If this goes down, it's just going to go down and you live with it. That's got to be really hard for somebody from a broadcast background to deal with. You guys have come up knowing that if you lose the signal, that's the end of the world. It's over, you know, and and suddenly now you have to say, okay, well, we're going to have to roll with the punches. So how, how have you guys weathered that? And, and uh, Nicholas, I'll let you start and then Andy. Um, you know, how, how have you adjust, adjusted expectations, essentially? Well, I think it's, you know, we've, we've gone from doing the more traditional shows where we can have satellite trucks on site and we do all these typical fail safes where it feels like there's so many safety nets that, that you can't almost see through them. That's a very safe space. I think here, we kind of create the same level of safety nets as just by doing other things, right? So content would be a good example. Here we can maximize outputting content to your point exactly Maybe instead of going 100% in quality, we do 80, but we get a ton of content. That means that should we face any type of delay, then we'll be sure to be able to entertain the fans, right? I think that's one way of doing it. So I think we're kind of creating the same amount of safety nets, um, but then again, operating with with things like, you know, commentators being too far away, physically commentating, and just having the slightest millisecond delay in what we're receiving, that kind of ruins the entire viewing experience, right? If someone doesn't react to the second when something happens, you as the viewer are thrown off immediately. So I think stuff like that we'll probably never be able to solve, but then we solve that by amping content, getting people in instead, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the content play is, is huge because it creates a, a great safety net, even though we, we don't want to use it for too long, if that makes sense. And Simon over at ESL, how are you guys dealing with that uh, right now? 
I mean, core was always for us the game, right? This is where we keep the quality bar as high as possible. I, I think uh, when you do a remote interview, their content becomes king. And uh, even though you recognize maybe some artifacts popping up or some lags happen here and there, maybe an interview is a little bit uh, desync, has some additional delays, there's no harm done. And uh, it's still the content is there. And that's, I think, what everyone appreciates. And that's what we focus on. Same question, Andy. How have you adjusted your own expectations and fans' expectations? So I, I would say we've still kept the element of redundancy, at least. And one of the examples I give for this is jumping back to the observer. So typically, that person who's controlling the game cameras, we can't, if they're remote, we still have always had somebody there who can do the job. We, we've always, and that's a very much an esports mentality. It might be me walking around. It might be a second observer. It might be, we might have a replay guy who's there and a replay guy who's not. So it's almost like having a redundant level of staffing so that if something does happen to that person, they do drop away. We don't lose them completely. We have somebody who can jump in, fill that seat, be it for 10 minutes if their internet's down, because that's always our biggest battle, to be honest, is, is yeah. just our ISPs all over the world. Um, incredibly, notoriously unreliable. So um, yeah, that's been one of the things we, we've we've kind of adapted for that redundancy and we, we kind of expect it. So as Nicholas has said, having some content as a backup plan or having having a sort of like train of events that we're going to follow if if this doesn't happen. And that's something that esports has done right from the very start. And I think it's being this good enough level is something that actually we've always been following anyway. Um, so we, we're already ready to learn how to, oh, the feed's just gone down quickly. What are we going to do now? Well, we've got this backup plan we can jump to. That kind of stuff is something we've always done. So I think those kind of levels of redundancies are something that's just really played into esports' hands anyway. Um, yeah. And we're just keen to continue to, to do what we've always done. And it's, it's fortunately working out for us pretty well at the moment. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to ask you something in relation to, I think a lot of people watching obviously come from more of the traditional sports broadcast, traditional sports production space. And I've always viewed esports uh, producers and esports broadcasters as kind of a North Star uh, when it comes to cloud-based technology, uh, again, remote technology, these types of things. And that's uh, a lot of that is, is in no way a fault of traditional broadcasters because they have a lot of legacy uh, technology. They have huge, massive investments in broadcast centers and, and uh, infrastructure, um, whereas most esports operators don't and, and are more agile as a result. So I want to ask you guys, with that in mind, if you were to give some advice to somebody from one of the more uh, traditional uh, sports broadcast outlets or sports production houses on how to embrace some of these, again, uh, sometimes bleeding edge, but definitely next gen uh, workflows that are remote and cloud based and sometimes public internet based. What's a piece of advice that you might give them uh, in order to embrace this and, and, and figure out how to do it on their own? Uh, Nicholas, go for it. Sure, I think um, one one good example here is is to just look at the software that's around you, right? That isn't necessarily big, expensive, and fancy, or requires a big mixer to do X, Y, C. There is things that will require that, but I think for us, um, playing around with Discord, like uh, softwares like Discord, sorry, to try to see could we utilize that as our method of receiving all these video signals for the player cams was one way of using something completely novel when you look at it from a software perspective, but it gave us a lot of capabilities within the production. So I think being being open-minded to not everything having to come from these big stable houses that typically produce television equipment, et cetera, and not being afraid of picking it apart. Because I think if I look at our technical team, they, they're probably like technology pirates in some degree. They've kind of reassembled everything in a new way, right? All the things that we bought, which cost a ton of money, doesn't really look the same anymore, right? There's been added weird things to it everywhere. So I think just not being afraid of playing around with the tech you have and and the tech that's in front of you that you might overlook normally would, would be a good tip. And then I think, I don't know if it's also production related, the question as to the product itself. Sure. Um, because I think there, they probably have on shoulders, on their shoulders, a task much greater than ours, right? They're trying to get our audience back into the stadiums, back into the broadcast watching traditional sports, right? we can see the audience moving over to us. They're trying to move them back. And I think that's a, an interesting fight that we're excited about having. So I think with that in mind, 
maybe try to also look and, and be inspired within the esports realm, the streaming realm, as to how this new extremely woke, woke and extremely engaged audience operates. Because I think the more traditional sports can lean into that, the more it'll begin swaying, you know, the the viewers back to them. So that's a bit more of a broader holistic thing, but a challenge that I don't envy. And Simon, what about you? Uh, what are you thinking on this one? My, my main advice is be, be open. There are so many cool pieces of software that actually replace hardware these days. I do understand uh, the classic engineering approaches of uh, physical paths and everything, but those can also be displayed in software. And uh, there's just so many amazing uh, opportunities out there uh, when, you, when you check on that. And yeah, just uh, have a look and uh, be open to it. Sure. Yeah. And once you go down that IP path, uh, it opens up a lot of new paths, right? To, uh, uh, you, you know, whatever might come down the line. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, cloud-based tools that are very mandatory, uh, core-focused uh, in that sense uh, of features of routing for audio, video, and other capabilities. But when you now see uh, capabilities of cloud editing, uh, contribution, uh, metadata workflows, uh, SRT features, and whatnot, it, it's just amazing to see and uh, even though uh, Corona uh, is there, unfortunately, uh, it uh, did uh, speed up a lot of uh, those inventions and the development of those tools. And yeah, again, uh, please use them. Andy, uh, same thing. Any advice for uh, traditional broadcasters out there in this uh, age that we're living in? Um, quite honestly, I mean, I come from a software background, so I'm, I'm slightly biased to start off with. But software is definitely something that I mean, they probably already realized is, is very, very crucial to the modern world and technology can definitely be bended in different, many different ways to make outputs that seemingly this box used to cost $20,000 or whatever. Now we can make that for, for a hundred. It's things like that, that sort of give you the edge and it, it this, this sort of knock back on quality. So sort of like is 80% good enough? Well, work out your priorities, work out what is at the top of your priorities, what has to not fail. On-air critical stuff, yeah, don't mess around with that stuff. But if you're doing an interview with some fans or something like that, maybe try something that's a little bit different. Maybe you'll get different results. Maybe you'll be able to get them to interact with the studio a bit more through something that's not quite so um, common. There's all sorts of different technologies out there and it changes every single day. It's almost impossible to keep on top of it all. But just a few bets in the technology field, a couple of smart developers, can really, really, really change your production in terms of like getting some new feature that you never thought was possible. And that's something that if you explore things like Twitch and stuff like that, that is very, very esports focused or very, very gaming focused, you might see new ideas that sort of help you to broaden your horizons um, for more main media, media sports. Sure. Maybe just to add on that, a quick note, I don't want to have it look like we stand here on our high horses, <laughs> like a know it all. So I think uh, knowing respectfully who's also watching, right? I think everything that, that they're doing is what we're implementing as well and just taking our own spin to, right? So the way they produced and have produced this is kind of what has enabled us to be able to do all the weird hacking that Andy mentioned and, and I talked about as well. And, and the foundation is what they created. We're kind of just pirating it and <laughs> enhancing it. Right. There's Absolutely. definitely a lot of, it's a hack, it's a hacking community, right? So pi a pirating. Totally. Yeah. And, and there's definitely sort of like a warning of things that come with it because it probably won't always go right first time. And you're probably going to have to go back and adjust it a bit. If you, yeah. if you do want that reliance, that's where you spend the 10 grand on the box. Yep. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I, I want to also ask, uh, I think Nicholas, you had mentioned it earlier, but look, uh, you know, COVID fatigue, uh, quarantine fatigue, this is this is a real thing. And and while esports has seen tremendous numbers uh, over the last year in terms of viewership and, and content and engagement, um, you know, what was acceptable at the beginning, uh, people, you know, very much got tired of rather quickly and you had to keep upping that entertainment level ante. So how have you guys continued to evolve your shows over the last year to say, okay, we did it, but now it's got to go up better if people are going to keep watching and keep being interested? Sure. I think it's, it's having a very fluid and agile mindset as to what the audience is telling you almost in real time sometimes, right? Like I mentioned, we pulled the fan cams when they didn't have a positive impact on the product. And I think being mindful of that is, is beneficial. I think the way we've done it in the other direction is 
all these feeds that we send out and distribute and got in was very static player cameras, either a big shot of a room with a lot of people in it, all these different things. So I think what we did was to work closely with the social media teams and all the different teams that the, the organization already has as an infrastructure to help pick up the camera, follow the players when they go out of the room. All of a sudden you've taken you know, the static shot that the audience has become used to seeing for so many months now, we're bringing it to life, right? So again, a simple analog trick of just expanding their field of view and opening up that little world, which could be a bedroom, a training room or whatever it could be, became a huge thing, right? Because all of a sudden you're, you're bringing that to life. So I think that would be um, one place that, that significantly helped, but was tricky still, right? And I think yeah. just being open and, and understanding when it turns to, to COVID fatigue and people are getting annoyed and, and then have something up your sleeve for when that happens, right? I think that's crucial. Yeah. Um, and you guys also have that, let's be honest, you have the added benefit of most of this being on Twitch or YouTube yeah. gaming where you can have instant feedback from the fans, you know, <laughs> yes. while of course traditional sports <laughs> leagues have Twitter and social and things like that. It's not quite as much of a direct and sometimes it's a blessing. I know you guys know that it can be pretty, pretty toxic sometimes. But um Andy, uh same question. How have you continued to, you know, make sure people tune in that it's not just same old, same old? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Nicholas raised some very good points there. Stuff like for me it's been relating to to what's going on like we can't nobody can ignore the fact there's a pandemic going on it's bringing some kind of relativity into people's lives is that it's not just them going through it yes we're able to do our jobs but the teams are facing this we're facing this everyone is facing this together and we've just been trying to sort of bring a little inch of normality back where we can one of the things we did in flashpoint um which is one of our counter-strike products um is to to recreate a bar and that was part of the show and it's kind of like going through like community aspects like the history of the of the counter-strike sort of um ecosystem and where it's come from um sharing a pint with some friends incorporating tweets and stuff fun stuff that's gone through the day just making it an entertainment and a light break sort of just from the seriousness of esports as well um and just relating to the situation that everyone's in it, it's really hard for for people who are stuck at home um doing not a lot and for many who are stuck in a very small space games has become a lifeline to them and it's something that are as i mentioned earlier our platform side of our business has seen massive growth because of it that side of things it's just relating to gamers and sort of like trying to get on their level and making sure that you know it's just it's us and you we're, we're here to make something that you guys enjoy we're here to make something that is for you um let's connect let's try and try and be as relative to each other as we can sure great simon i was just asking these guys uh you know what what have you done to continue to sort of up the entertainment factor ante uh, in your broadcast compared to at the beginning of the pandemic when maybe things were acceptable, everybody was just happy to have content on the air, but COVID fatigue is real, quarantine fatigue is real, and people need a little bit more to tune in. How have you guys continued to evolve your shows over the last uh, year or so? I think this has many layers uh, to it in the end. Uh, the, the storytelling and the sports itself, uh, even though I'm repeating myself, right? This, this is the core and that needs to work. Uh, the rest is a little bit of a luxury. The first broadcast, we still used real sets. Obviously then everyone uh, jumped on the virtual studio hype train uh, to have variety, right? Something interesting uh, content that you bring up that is a little bit more uh, casual probably overall but also a little bit more contextual. I think our social media team, even though this is not core broadcast, but this is in a wider sense, uh, near live content and, and shoulder content being produced around, they did an amazing job. So it's, it's the bits and pieces that we try to improve than rather trying to uh, come back to this has to be that way done. It's still an agile process. We're changing workflows on a daily, weekly basis almost. And uh, we just try to be also there internally open-minded on, on what we actually want to achieve and how we can do that. Nicholas, I uh, want to also start asking as, again, I know that it's very much in flux and we are by no means out of the woods, but we're hoping that LAN events are going to resume um, at some point in the somewhat near future. And, you know, you'll, you'll maybe have trucks on site or you won't, you'll, you'll remain remote. So, uh, do you have a sense of what that might look like for you guys? Do you think you'll have 
um, you know, go back to, hey, there's a truck on site and a crew on site, and that's how we're going to do it, or all remote, or probably what I would think is a hybrid of the two, right? Yeah, I think it's it will probably be foolish to think that we're going to go from zero to 100, right, kilometers an hour, and, and from this to a, to a full arena. I at least probably don't think that will be safe given the, the climate in the world right now. So I think this delta from where we're at now back to that full arena is, is an interesting one, right? I think what we will see is, and we're of course looking into that as well, is how many amounts of fans could you potentially get in at a given time at one place and could you get the players in as well, right? Because I think the players will ultimately be the biggest challenge because even when we've identified places that could be deemed safe to hold an event in, doesn't mean you can get anyone in, right? Just right. one travel restriction, one place in the world can throw your entire event plan off, right? And I think it's being mindful of that probably means that either a bubble needs to be created or time has to pass enough for, for that to be more realistic. So it'll be interesting to see if, if the first event is with players on site first or fans on site first. And, and fans on site first probably seems like uh, the safest route. Sure, yeah. And Simon, you have any thoughts on this one from your perspective? I think it depends on the task that you have. Uh, if you return to everything classic again, or if if you try to to bend reality towards a brighter future in that sense that you don't have such a logistical nightmare anymore. And uh, utilization and uh, redundancy um, is always uh, important and will stay important. And I think in many areas, it, it can be a good mix, maybe saving someone here and there to monitor uh, that you can uh, leave at home or connect someone to contribute from an editorial perspective where you felt in the past, this person also by definition needs to be part of the control room. Uh, I think communication got very clearer during the productions. Um, so getting rid of old habits and being open for the new is rather the, the agenda and the change of mindset here uh, that uh, is valuable and will be continuing for everyone to improve. Andy, same thing. Do you think that you'll have an OB unit, uh, you know, on site when, when these events return or, or maybe, uh, you know, again, a hybrid where some people are remote and, and some people are in the, the truck? So we're, we're actually in the position where we have an operating land at the moment. Um, we're, we're running the, the Rainbow Six North American League, which is, is taking place in, in Las Vegas at the moment. Right. Um, we're actually operating a really interesting model. We, we don't have production on site. Basically, we have a couple of guys on the ground who are looking after cameras and um, critical resources at, at the at the eSports Arena um, control room. And then we're, we're feeding everything back to our Los Angeles studio, where our regular crew who are completely separate from the players. So both, both sides of the, they never meet ever um they're basically split completely and and then we are we've got all of our talent remote still um and so we're easing back into it and it's been a process we've been sort of engaged in since um november last year we did our first one there we just had a couple of days events it's been something we're easing back into um using the resources and keeping everybody tested everybody covid safe it's one of those things that we can take slowly we can do naturally but that's we're really fortunate that all the players live in las vegas all the teams were positioned in las vegas it, it, it's a regional league so it's not something that is um requires to fly players from over the world because nicholas is completely right it's a nightmare trying to get anywhere at the moment is an absolute nightmare <laughs> and you never know what's going to happen I, i'm really hopeful that we're going to see some changes from from the uk and the us i think probably in, in the near future that will open some doors um for, for a road back to LAN. um i think they'll come back and i think they'll come back with a robotic presence I think we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of robots in in those productions, from a cost perspective, but also from a safety perspective. They they tick both boxes. Um, they're going to make small sets and stuff like that, and limited audience, um, and we're going to have to be a lot more creative with what we do. But I think with all of that, we can see a road back that's going to that's going to bring us um, into a world where we actually have players on site, and hopefully have some fans as well. Um, I would prioritize the players because obviously that that's the main thing for the competition, the tournament integrity. But as, as Nicholas said, it, it really isn't time they're getting them anywhere at the moment, um, which is not a massive problem for for sort of regional or uh, countrywide sports leagues. It's something that's quite unique to esports and perhaps only really comparable with the Olympics, which is obviously not letting any uh, international spectators um, visit. So it's uh, it's a kind of a similar situation to that, really. 
yeah, nothing, there's no uh, property or no uh, sector of the media industry that's more global than esports. Um, mm. And that's something that the pandemic has, has really been a challenge for you guys, I know. Um, I want to close out here, uh, again, looking forward, looking towards the future, not asking for you to break out a crystal ball and tell us exactly <laughs> what is coming down the line. But I'm curious, in 60 seconds or less, we'll keep it tight. Give me one prediction that you can uh, that you expect that you foresee happening in the esports production space in the next twelve months, knowing that everything is still very much up in the air. But one prediction for the esports production space that's going to happen in the next year, Nicholas, your first step. Sure, I think uh, one big bet would probably be around how fans engage with an event. Right, I think we've we've only scratched the surface of what it is when fans join a Zoom call and take part. And I think going into a realm of where an event and experience is a two-way experience and not just a one-way and one way, meaning, you know, us producing something into a void or the fans screaming into a void on the Twitch chat. I think figuring out how the two can play together and impact each other is going to be uh, potentially big in the future. And I think there we've only just scratched the surface and I'm, I'm sure eSport will, will be some of those to champion whatever comes next. And Simon, what about you? Uh, what are you thinking on this one? So in 60 seconds, uh, first of all, this is my highest hope. I can come back to the venue and hug everyone again and uh, be with them in presence, uh, talk about what we uh, achieved and what we uh, have now as a foundation to build upon. I do really hope that we will have tens of thousands of fans in front of players again soon and cheering. On the other hand, we can see how great of a community everyone is that participates in esports and how open the door for everyone in the outside the community is to join esports and um, if we have to continue what we do currently for another 12 months and we're all safe i think that's also okay uh andy what about you one one prediction for me i'm and i'm going to broaden it a little bit to not just esports but gaming entertainment and just the kind of entertainment that we're, we're leading from. Um, I think there's going to be a massive, massive change in that. Uh, we've seen an explosion of things like Twitch, but I think it's going to grow even more. I think there's so much focus on the individuals and the content that is being produced around the individuals. And we've seen, as we spoke about earlier, that 80% sort of level of what is acceptable. I think that changes things massively for the industry as a whole. All of a sudden, we're going to start seeing people who are focusing on entertaining with the right people rather than having necessarily a crew with massive amounts of technology and stuff like that. I think that is really something that's going to come out of this pandemic and change the face of the entertainment industry as a whole. And esports is just something that's at the cusp of where, where we are, basically. And that's what we've been doing. It's just pushing that further and perhaps using a lot more techniques that we've been using to really broaden out the entertainment industry and make things more accessible. I think that's something that's just going to come as a, as a natural byproduct of the pandemic. And I think it's something we start to see already. Sure. I mean, we've seen the launch of, of uh, gaming lifestyle networks and, and lots of gaming lifestyle programming. And, and you know, it's esports is the, the core, the axis of that. But there's so much more content that can, you know, uh, revolve around that access. And I couldn't agree more, Andy. I think we're just going to see a lot, uh, just more and more content uh, in the coming years when it comes to esports. Gentlemen, thank you guys so much. Really, really appreciate you taking the time. We know how busy you are. So thanks for giving everybody a little bit of insight into uh, what esports production is like in the age of COVID. Uh, and stay safe. Stay healthy, guys.